Hello. This is an edited transcript of a Veterans History Project interview conducted on Tuesday afternoon, May 23, 2006, at the Niles Public Library. The interviewer is Mr. Neil O'Shea of the Niles Public Library, and he interviewed Mr. Martin O'Grady. Mr. O'Shea began the interview by asking Mr. O'Grady if he were born in 1949. Mr. O'Grady said no, 1942. Mr. O'Shea then stated that Mr. O'Grady served in the Korean area of operations on the DMZ. He was a career officer in the United States Army Reserve. He wanted to thank him for coming in to be interviewed and for consenting to the interview for the purposes of the Veterans History Project. Mr. O'Shea then asked Mr. O'Grady, what were you doing before you joined the service? Mr. O'Grady responded that he was a college student at Loyola University, Chicago, and participated in the Loyola University ROTC program. Upon graduation from Loyola in 9 June 1964, Mr. O'Grady was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army Reserve. He attended Loyola's law school from September of 1964 until June of 1965. He then volunteered for active duty in August of 1965 and, was re and received orders to report to Fort Benning, Georgia in early October of 1965. Mr. O'Shea asked Mr. O'Grady if he were in the ROTC program in high school, and Mr. O'Grady said no. Notre Dame High School for Boys in Niles, Illinois, where he attended high school, did know for an ROTC program. Mr. O'Shea asked Mr. O'Grady what he majored in in college, and Mr. O'Grady responded that he majored in psychology and minored in Spanish. Mr. O'Shea then asked Mr. O'Grady, when the war breaks out in 1950, did you have any idea in your head that you were going to be going to, or Mr. O'Grady responded, no, I was a child in 1950. I would, I would have been about eight years old. However, as the Korean War progressed, young men in our neighborhood, boys who lived near us, went. Also, my father was a World War II veteran, an officer, and served in the Army Reserve, and we knew that he could be recalled at any time. So yes, I knew about the Korean War, Mr. O'Grady said. My father would talk to us about it, but it wasn't a major topic. I was aware that the war was happening and what it was all about. And I remember that when Stalin died, some of the GIs in Korea made a sign posted on one of their positions which read, Ho, ho, ho. Joe is dead, so they said that's one less red. Mr. O'Shea then said yes, and Mr. O'Grady responded, yeah, he said, I remember that, and the photo of the sign as it appeared in the magazine or a newspaper when I was a child. So tell me more about 1964. Well, Mr. O'Grady responded, he graduated from college in 1964 and was in law school from September of 1964 until June of 1965. Mr. O'Shea then asked, and they put you, you had to come out of law school then, and Mr. O'Grady responded, no, I actually volunteered. I asked to go on active duty in the summer of 1965. Mr. O'Shea then inquired, was there any chance that you would have been sent to Vietnam at the time? Mr. O'Grady said yes. In fact, he had originally asked to go to Vietnam. And Mr. O'Shea then asked, why didn't you go to Vietnam? What, was the, what happened there? Mr. O'Grady said and explained that prior to 1965, the Army only sent highly experienced advisors to Vietnam to train the Vietnamese. U.S. division size units, combat units, did not get sent to Vietnam until, as he recalled, April of 1965. Although he's not sure, he believed that the 1st Infantry Division or the 1st Cavalry Division that went to, it went to Vietnam in 19, April of 1965. These units were staffed by seasoned officers, officers who were experienced and had served with the units for a period of time. It was not uncommon, for example, that a first lieutenant would lead a platoon, a job normally assigned to second lieutenants. Keep in mind that this was early in the Vietnam War, Mr. O'Grady explained, the situation would change as the war progressed. Mr. O'Shea then asked Mr. O'Grady if his father thought that it was a good idea that he volunteered for Vietnam. And Mr. O'Grady responded, well, my dad really wanted me to stay in law school, and he didn't like the fact that I was going into the infantry. He thought that I should have been an MP, a military police officer, since that would have been more consistent with a career as an attorney. But to make a long story short, Mr. O'Grady responded, the Army was sending experienced officers. For example, as he said earlier, platoon leaders oftentimes were first lieutenants, not second lieutenants. 
They were officers who had been with their units for a period of time. I don't think that any, <clears throat> at that point in our nation's history, we ever thought that we would be in fighting in uh, Vietnam as long as we ultimately did. Seasoned troops would be committed and successfully complete the operational mission quickly and then be withdrawn. When Mr. O'Grady volunteered at Fifth Army Headquarters, he spoke with an officer at the officer's assignment branch, the infantry branch at the Department of the Army in Washington, D.C. He was thanked for volunteering to go to Vietnam and explained that he was too inexperienced to serve in Vietnam at that time and that he was going to be given a, the next best inf infantry assignment in the Army. And that was going to the DMZ in Korea. And that's, that was a story. There uh, wasn't much more to it than that. So was the decision made by that officer, the, the officer, uh, officer in Washington, D.C. at OPO Infantry, the Office of Personnel Management Infantry, Mr. O'Shea inquired, Mr. O'Grady said, perhaps better said the Army. The needs of the Army always take precedence over personal wishes. Officers who manage personal assignments, for example, in my case, infantry branch, make the decisions. These officers know how many people they need, when they need them, where they need them, and what special skills and experience they have to have. So the needs of the Army always dictate what personnel assignments will be made. Mr. O'Shea then inquired, so were you disappointed then that you were, not, that you were being sent to Korea instead of Vietnam? Mr. O'Grady said, not really. For me, Vietnam was like a football game in a way. The war was going to be over in a year, and I thought that I wanted to be part of it. I didn't want to be left out. It wasn't until my friends began becoming casualties, the first of November of 1965, that I realized that this wasn't a, a game, that it was war. Then Mr. O'Shea asked, when you volunteer, Vietnam was just starting out? Mr. O'Grady said, yes, just beginning. And it, became, and it becomes extraordinarily important because tactics and equipment are changing. It's the air mobile world beginning to emerge. First CAV, for example, with helicopters and equipment and tactics appropriate to air mobile operations. We were trained in these tactics and some of the equipment of Fort Benning. The M16 rifle was new and a short supply due to Vietnam, so we trained on M14s, for example. The new platoon level portable radio, the PRC-25, or as it was called, the PRIC-25, was also in short supply due to Vietnam, and we trained on it slightly. In Korea, I used a PRC-10, a PRIC-10 again as it was called, a Korean War vintage radio. Korea was a different world. We were more Korean War era in terms of equipment and everything else. Mr. O'Shea then said, yes, it seems like a lot of the vets say at the beginning of these wars, it's the Army. Uh, is using equipment from the last war, the tactics and things like that. It takes a while to catch up. And Mr. O'Grady said, well, that's logical when you think about it. The public, through its elected representatives, has to make decisions about, about national defense. Spending money on personnel, training, and equipment is often viewed as of lesser importance until hostilities break out. Then it's a little late in the game. It's like that old saying, God and the soldiers, all men adore, in times of trouble and unknown more. When the fighting is over and all things righted, God is forgotten and the soldier is slighted. Thank goodness we've had some magnificent presidents and elected officials over the years who understand the need for strong military and make necessary resources available. Mr. O'Grady added that he hoped that, he would never, that we would never as a nation lose this kind of civilian leadership so essential to our survival as a country. So, Mr. O'Shea then asked, uh, did you have to go uh, when you made your break with civilian life or whatever uh, and you were going into this active duty status or whatever? And Mr. O'Grady responded, yes, I was commissioned as an infantry second lieutenant in the USAR, the United States Army Reserve, 9 June 64, the day I received my undergraduate degree. Then I was delayed and called to active duty to attend law school. I went on active duty in October of 65 as a USAR officer an obligated volunteer, as it was called. So I had to give the Army a minimum of two years active duty. So, so you owe the Army two years of active duty, Mr. O'Shea inquired. Mr. O'Grady said, yes, a minimum of two years active duty. My actual contract for, was for a total of six years service with no less than two years of active duty. A concept was that you would serve two years on active duty, three years in the active reserve, and one year in the inactive reserve for a total of six years. Mr. O'Shea confirmed six years. Mr. O'Grady said yes in total. 
And then Mr. O'Shea asked, uh, were you getting any uh, help while you were in law school, cost of tuition or anything like that? Mr. O'Grady said, no. The Army granted me a delay in call to active duty. I could go to law school. I was not paid, nor did I have to attend any training while I was in law school because of my delayed status. So he had four years of ROTC at Loyola, yes. And then Mr. O'Shea said, uh, what do you do then? Do you have to get some more training in the United States before you go to Korea? And the answer Mr. O'Grady gave was yes. Do you know much about the ROTC program, he asked Mr. O'Shea. Mr. O'Shea said, not, not a lot, but some. Mr. O'Grady then continued, well, the way it worked for me is that I attended ROTC classes and drills for four years of college. Each semester I took one three-hour course and one approximately two-hour drill per week. The courses were integrated into my schedule just like other courses. Courses were academically focused, tested, and graded, and presented such material as U.S. military history, leadership, communications, logistics, security, and so forth. The instructors were Army non-commissioned officers and commissioned officers who were assigned to the, to the Department of Military Science. Many of them were combat veterans and presented interesting and informative classes. So the courses were realistic, delivered by people who were actually there, who lived the ex and experienced what they taught. The weekly two-hour drill was devoted to marksmanship, drill and ceremony, and learning to function within the military hierarchy. Our cadet corps consisted of formations like a regular army unit, and you had the opportunity to experience what it was like to be a private for, uh, to be uh, a private all the way up to whatever rank you achieved by senior year. For example, Mr. O'Grady started as a cadet private and over the four years served as a fire team leader, a squad leader, a platoon leader, a company commander, and finally a battalion commander in his senior year. Between junior and senior year, he attended what is essentially basic training. And then Mr. O'Shea uh, basically said, could you expand further? Mr. O'Grady said, well, in our case, the training was conducted at Fort Riley, Kansas in the summer of 1963. If I recall correctly, we were there for about five or more weeks. And that's where you receive what is very much like basic training. You learn small unit tactics, weapons, marksmanship, communications, security, leadership, and qualify both on the physical combat proficiency test, the marksmanship course. In senior year, prior to graduation and appointment as a commissioned officer, branch selection takes place. You decide what branch you want to be in, and that again is subject to the needs of the Army. For example, you might choose infantry, armor, artillery, military, police, intelligence, and so forth. You then pick a second and third choice in the event your first choice is not available. When you are commissioned at graduation, you will be commissioned in the branch you selected. Ordinarily, when you go on active duty, the first thing you attend is what is called Officer's Basic Course, OBC. In my case, it was IOBC, Infantry Officer Basic Course. Actually, in the autumn of 1965, it was called the Combat Platoon Leaders Course, or CPLC. And in fact, in our case, I think it was CPLC-4. And that lasted for approximately 13 weeks. And that's where you receive intense training, whatever your branch is. Following completion of OBC, OBC you are deployed. So help me here. Um, well, Mr. O'Grady went on. I was called to active duty in late summer of 1965 in order to report to Fort Benning for IOBC or CPLC as it was called in October. You were called to active duty? Yes. I received orders <coughs> from the Army ordering me to report to Fort Benning, Georgia in October. I attended the Infantry Officer Basic Course, the Combat Platoon Leaders Course from October through December and also completed the Airborne School in early January of 1966. After I completed training in early January, I took a short leave and reported to Korea. And then you reported, Mr. O'Shea asked, to, to Korea in February. No, Mr. O'Grady said I reported in late January. And Mr. O'Shea said, so you fly to Japan or you fly to Korea or you went by boat or how did you get there? Well, we actually departed from Travis Air Force Base. I flew from Chicago to Travis in a civilian aircraft and then flew from Travis on a contracted military flight. Where's Travis, Mr. O'Shea inquired. Travis is near San Francisco. Oh, okay, Mr. O'Shea said. Then he asked, um, what happened after Travis? Well, we flew from Travis taking the polar route. In fact, as I recall, we stopped in Alaska to pick people up and then into Japan and finally into Korea. 
by air, yes, by air. Uh, cultural shock on the first day. Uh, did you land in Seoul or Pusan, Mr. O'Shea inquired. And Mr. O'Reilly responded, well, we landed in Seoul, the Kimpo Airport. Landing in Korea was somewhat unsettling. We were trained for a much different experience, an armed and hostile enemy. I felt very uncomfortable when I got off the plane and buses picked us up. I was, it was cultural shock. A few hours before, I was on, in my own country with people who looked familiar to me and spoke my language. Now all of a sudden, the world changes and I'm in a different person's world. A person who looks unfamiliar to me, speaks a language I do not know, and dresses differently. Even the smells, the odors of the people and their country were different. And then there were the sandbags. There were no sandbags covering the floor of the bus or the sides of the bus, and there wasn't any mesh on the windows. And the local people were in close proximity to the bus as it drove down the roads. There were literally thousands of people around. I was waiting for someone to chuck a grenade through the window. Mr. O'Shea said, yes, please continue. So you had to make peace with that. My major recollection of that day, though, was that we were very tired. It was a very long flight, about 18 hours, as I recall, and uh, in which I didn't get any sleep. I flew over with classmates from the IOBC CPLC Airborne School at Fort Benning. Tragically, one of the lieutenants, not a Benning classmate with whom I flew from Chicago to Travis, was killed about three weeks later in Vietnam. The bus trip from Kimpo followed the MSR, the main supply route, north out of Seoul to the vicinity of a, an area called Bang Il Chen. And Camp Howes was the division headquarters, headquarters of the 2nd Infantry Division. On the bus trip to Camp Howes, I observed literally thousands upon thousands of Korean civilian workers on the outskirts of Seoul, breaking rocks and stones with little mallets to form the bed of what is today a modern highway. I had never seen so many people in one place before, and that is saying something since I am a Chicagoan and accustomed to crowds. Another impression I had of Korea was poverty. Living conditions appeared austere at best in many places. So Korea has come a long way, uh, Mr. O'Shea said. Mr. O'Grady said, yes, it has. Mr. O'Shea then asked, did you travel a lot before you were in the Army or before you were being posted overseas? Mr. O'Grady said, not really. My dad was an officer in World War II, so we lived in the South in Alabama. I also lived in Puerto Rico for a couple of years. But keep in mind, I was a very young child at this time, between ages two and five. I'd also lived in Wisconsin for the summer since I was in my teens. Mr. O'Shea then inquired about Mr. O'Grady's arrival at the second division headquarters and receiving an assignment. And Mr. O'Grady said, yeah, it was um, a different world. As I recall, I and eight of my classmates from Fort Benning, nine of us in total, reported for assignment to the 2nd Infantry Division that day. We were gathered in an office and given a briefing to the division. The division consisted of three brigades. The 1st and 2nd Brigades were located south of the Imjim River, and the 3rd Brigade consisting of three battalions, the 2nd of the 23rd Mechanized Infantry, the 1st of the 38th Infantry, and the 4th of the 7th Cavalry, were located north of the Imjim River and were actually deployed in the DMZ. The briefer told us that the 3rd Brigade was the infantryman's paradise, and you would likely see action if assigned to one of the units there. So Mr. O'Grady explained that he looked around the room and calculated the odds of being assigned to the 3rd Brigade as 6-3. to three. As it turned out, it was 7-2. to two. Kenny Bogdan, a friend of Mr. O'Grady's from Fort Benning, and he were assigned to the 3rd Brigade, all the others that were assigned to the 1st and 2nd Brigades. Mr. O'Grady remembered that he felt uncomfortable and the others were told that their jeeps would come to pick them up sometime in the next several hours. Kenny Bogdan and Mr. O'Grady were told to, help, to, to report to the helipad and wait. Eventually a chopper would come for them and fly them to the 3rd Brigade. That was a hotter place, was it, Mr. O'Shea inquired. Mr. O'Grady said yes. That was the 3rd Brigade. By then I was smart enough to know that this wasn't a football game. This was serious business. And when you're flying over positions, you look down, it was light enough to see artillery positions and other defensive positions dug into the tops and sides of the hills and mountains. It was really a wake-up call. So Mr. O'Shea inquired again, at this time, how many thousands of troops do you think were in Korea? Mr. O'Grady responded, you know, I'm not really sure. My guess is 80,000 plus. Wow, Mr. O'Shea said. Probably more than that. So then Mr. O'Shea asked, asked about the armistice agreement ending in the war. Mr. O'Grady said, yes, an armistice agreement 
for a truce did end the Korean War, and he went on to explain, Mr. O'Grady did, that because the divisions were a full strength, my guess is that they were running 14 to 15,000 people, maybe even more. Vietnam was beginning to have a bit of an impact, but in two divisions, the second division and the seventh division, I would estimate that there were 25 to 30,000 troops. And then there were many <coughs> rear support units, and I'm, not, and, and I'm just addressing army units. There were also many Air Force units, too, and lesser numbers of Navy and Marine personnel. Keep in mind that but for the 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Division, most personnel were assigned to units located south of DMZ. The Korean War did not end with a peace agreement. It ended with a, an armistice or a ceasefire agreement, as we previously talked about. And then Mr. O'Shea inquired a ceasefire agreement. Mr. O'Grady said, yes, a ceasefire, exactly. Part of the ceasefire agreement was the creation of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone to separate North and South. The ceasefire agreement had to be enforced and controlled. The North Koreans, from the very beginning of the armistice agreement, did not respect and frequently violated the terms of the agreement. They forcefully crossed the DMZ and attempted to operate in South Korea. So Mr. O'Shea then observed that Dream Rust drew the line. The DMZ is a, about a 51 long, 151 mile long strip, Mr. O'Grady explained, and it's about 2,000 meter wide on either side. It crosses the Korean Peninsula from east to west, roughly along the 38th parallel. The middle of the DMZ was called the MDL, the Military Demarcation Line. Now, the MDL became a strange place because the MDL was the only place theoretically lawfully where you could encounter an enemy soldier at arm's length. The North Koreans had a right to be in the vicinity of the MDL at the same time that you did. For example, both of you could be checking signposts. Did you ever have a, to be in the MDL? Yes, Mr. O'Grady responded occasionally. Most of my operations were immediately behind the MDL, several meters behind it. The people in our battalion's recon platoon, however, frequently walked the MDL and checked it out. Mr. O'Shea then said the reconnaissance platoon. Mr. O'Grady said, yes, their job was to clear the MDL on our side. The North Koreans would occasionally bury mines, and the job was very dangerous. Land that was safe to walk on the day before could be mined by the North Koreans, and all of a sudden the next day, one of your troops could step on a landmine and de could step on a landmine and detonate it. The recon people checked the MDL for mines, among other things. And then Mr. O'Shea inquired, was tunneling going on at that time? Mr. O'Grady said, yes. It was very interesting and somewhat scary, especially at night. Our battalion's fixed positions, an observation post named Dort, D-O-R-T, and three guard posts named Desart, Jansen, and Seiler were located on mountaintops. Desart, Jansen, and Seiler were the names of men who were killed in combat operations in the DMZ in the early 1960s. At night from these positions, you could observe the phosphorescent glow of the torches and welding equipment the North Koreans were using to support their tunnels. But these tunneling locations were only hundreds of meters away, as I recall. Between the normal sounds of the wind blowing, very loud, North Korean propaganda broadcast beamed at us from massive speakers, and the glow of their torches, you experienced a, a surrealistic event. Of course, while all this is happening, you are trying to focus by hearing, eyesight, and radar on North Korean movements in the front of you and the anticipation they will sought your position. So, so Mr. O'Shea then said, the tunnels, was that for their own protection? They were coming toward you? No, it was for their def it, it was not for their defense, Mr. O'Grady explained, but rather to support their offensive operations. They wanted to tunnel beneath the DMZ to enable them to move their troops and roll their armor through to attack South Korea, primarily Seoul. These tunnels afforded them both cover and concealment for such movements. Mr. O'Shea said, yes, could you explain further? This area was known as the Seoul Kaesong Quarter, Mr. O'Grady explained. It was a topographically favorable avenue of approach from the north for the North Koreans to move armor quickly between the hills and mountains from the north to the south. They, the area formed a relatively unimpeded natural passage into Seoul. And uh, Mr. O'Shea said uh, the, 
this was a, a, an avenue of approach for armor. And Mr. O'Grady said, well, armor and troops could theoretically quickly run through it. Obviously, our intention was to deny them use of this corridor. One key defensive position in this corridor was called Charlie Block near the town of Munsani. Charlie Block reminded me of the Fort Bojest, the book Bojest. It was fortified. It was a fortified position that would play a key role in thwarting any North Korean attack, especially an armor attack using the Seoul Kaesong Carter. So the worst case was they would have to face that or something, Mr. O'Shea said. Mr. O'Grady said, yes. Charlie Block, I'm sure, was prepared to stop anything that was going through the Seoul Kaesong Quarter towards Seoul. The area in the vicinity of Charlie Block was very open and wide as well. I remember getting caught in this area one time during the monsoon season. The area had flooded and almost looked like an ocean. The entire area of Moonsani, normally dry land, looked like an ocean. If you were to look at an ocean panorama with coastal mountains, that's what it would look like. It's interesting, too, to reflect that on the, during the monsoons, our minefields in the vicinity of the DMZ would be flooded. This was a very, very dangerous place to operate because the monsoons would often dislodge these buried mines, and you would have to be very careful when you walk. An area that was safe before the monsoons could be dangerous if the monsoons dislodged the mines. And Mr. O'Shea then said the mines would shift. Is that what would happen? And Mr. O'Reilly said, yes, exactly. Mines dislodged by monsoons and other flooding were a danger. Another mine-related concern was fires. Minefield-related concern was fires. The North Koreans would start fires when the wind was blowing toward the south with the intent to detonate our mines. As soon as there would be a strong southerly wind in the dry season, they would try to detonate the field by lighting old rice paddies and starting a conflagration. And Mr. O'Shea inquired, well, how do they do that? Uh, the oil or underwater or how do they light them? Mr. O'Grady said, I don't know what method they used to start the fires. Just light them, I guess. The paddies were old, dried out, unused, and overgrown with vegetation. In effect, they were fields of kindling. It wouldn't take much to ignite them. And then Mr. O'Shea said, because uh, it was just the spread of fire, is that what detonated them? Mr. O'Grady said, yes, fire. Fire would detonate them. Uh, or the heat, and, and Mr. O'Grady said, yes, the North Koreans expected the heat and fire to detonate the mines. Then Mr. O'Shea went on about the evening propaganda broadcast. At night they had propaganda broadcast. Did they have, like, a soul Sally or somebody? Or Mr. O'Grady said they did. In fact, it was kind of interesting because in my day, we'd sit, you'd listen to this. It was kind of, well, you'd laugh. You had to laugh. It was asinine. I thought it was asinine because it was incredibly stupid, but I suppose one of the things they were trying to exploit was perceived racial turmoil in the United States. Oh yeah, was that what was going on? Mr. O'Reilly said, well, they knew we had black troops in our units. What they were saying to black soldiers through the propaganda broadcast was, what are you doing up here, fighting for your country when back in the United States your people are being oppressed and Detroit and Chicago and Los Angeles, or things of that effect. Then they would play My Old Kentucky Home or some other Stephen Foster or other inappropriate songs. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, you would sit there and say, God Almighty, what are they doing? This is craziness. Unfortunately, none of my people fell for it. We would always laugh at it. I was also very concerned that the propaganda broadcast served as an attempt to distract my troops and even masked the sounds of movement toward our positions. The broadcasts were loud. You had to stay alert and be especially attentive to noises indicating movement. So you know, Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, how does the officer arriving interact and establish rapport with the soldiers, the foot soldiers? Mr. O'Grady said, I think it's like any other situation. Initially, you see everything. You overlook non-essentials and change things gradually. Utilize your subordinates as much as possible. It's getting to know the people and them getting to know you and your expectations, your standards. Eventually, after working closely together, you bond to develop unit cohesion. And then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know about meeting the other officers. Well, Mr. O'Grady explained, the night I arrived, I met the brigade commander. His name was Colonel Davenport, a gentleman. The 3rd Brigade headquarters was located close to the DMZ at Camp Young. Colonel Davenport said, when I was young, when I was your age, 
I was in Korea as an armor in an armor unit. I have an opening for you in a mechanized infantry unit, in a unit if you'd like that. Or I can also send you to a straight leg unit, the first of the 38. I've got an opening there too. But he added, I would like to send you to the second of the 23rd. I think it would be a good assignment for you. And I said, fine, sir. It was great meeting Colonel Davenport. He was a gentleman. After our meeting, I went up to the 3rd Brigade Officers Club and met many of the young officers in our brigade, several of them from my new battalion. I also socially met my new company commander that night. His name was Fred Harris, an outstanding officer, filling a captain's slot as a first lieutenant. Fred was a great teacher and tactically and technically highly proficient. I also met arguably the best platoon leader in the 2nd Infantry Division at the time, a second lieutenant named Harlan Fricky from West Point, the class of 1965. Harlan would prove to be a close friend during my time in Korea. And then Neil O'Shea wanted to know, Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, what, was, what would his rank have been as a West Point graduate, as a platoon leader? Was he a, and Mr. O'Grady responded, well, he was the same rank as me, the second lieutenant. No difference, Mr. O'Shea inquired. Mr. O'Grady said, yes, no difference. It's called source of commission. The only difference was that he went to West Point and I went to Loyola. As I gra and I also graduated as a DMS and a DMG. Theoretically, I was probably, and Mr. O'Shea then interrupted, meaning, well, a DMS means the distinguished military student, and DMG means distinguished military graduate. And theoretically, some might say I was the equivalent to a West Pointer. And the truth was I was not. The West Point graduates were, in my opinion, initially heads and shoulders above everyone else. As my career progressed, I'm sure I became as good as they or even better. But uh, initially, those kids were just outstanding. The service academy graduates, all service academies, uh, Navy, Air Force, uh, Army, and I'm sure the Coast Guard that I don't know much about are spectacular. They turn out magnificent young people. They're technically and technically extraordinarily competent. And I was fortunate. Harlan and I were hoochmates. Hoochmates, Mr. O'Shea inquired, what does that mean? Well, hooch is an Oriental expression for quarters. We shared the same quarters. Mr. O'Shea then said the same quarters. Well, we shared a room. We had a little Quonset hut. And then I, Mr. O'Shea continued further within processing. He wanted to know what happened after the introductions at the 3rd Brigade Officers Club. Mr. O'Grady said, well, Following my introductions at the officers club, the third brigade officers club, the next day, I had to get a gamma goblin shot. And Mr. O'Shea said, I, uh, and Mr. O'Grady further added, I had met the brigade Catholic chaplain, Father Francis Roke, the night before at the officers club, and he told me, you have to be very careful here. The country is rife with the disease. Make sure to wash your hands as often as you can. Hemorrhagic fever and bubonic plague were just two of the diseases that were extraordinarily concerned about. Rodents, insects, and other animals indigenous to the area carried some of the diseases. You know, what's that waterborne disease that you have when you turn yellow, Mr. O'Grady asked, and, and Mr. O'Shea said, hepatitis. Yes, hepatitis, Mr. O'Grady responded. The inoculations were designed to protect against these, these diseases as much as possible. Mr. O'Grady went for his inoculation the following morning and spoke with a young medic. The young medic said, Lieutenant, why don't you come back the following day? Mr. O'Grady said, I'll, 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 and he told Mr. O'Grady, I'll warm the gamma goblin up for you. And Mr. O'Grady thought he was putting him on. He said, okay, I'll come back the next morning. Well, Mr. O'Grady went back the following day, and Neil, you wouldn't believe what happened. The syringe that was there the next morning looked like a caulking gun. The syringe looked like something you'd inoculate a hell, an elephant or a horse with. So I laughed, and I told the medic, I thought you were putting me on. And the medic said, no, sir, it's for you. You weigh 185 pounds, and you'll take 10 cc's, you'll take 10 cc's per 10 pounds of weight, or something like that, as I recall. He added, you're going to get it in both cheeks. Unless I had warmed this up for you and inoculated it in cold, you wouldn't have been able to sit down for a week without pain. So I was lucky. The syringe was scary looking, but I got the shots, was able to sit down without discomfort, and fortunately never contracted any disease. Following my meeting with Colonel Davenport and introductions to brigade officers at the officers club the next morning, I met Colonel Frank, Frank e. Santangelo, the commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion, 23rd Infantry Mechanized. This was the battalion to which I was assigned. 
an interesting story about him was that during our interview, he asked me if I liked photography. I thought, gee, this is odd. So I said, no, but I had a camera in my gear. As I later learned from one of the people, from one of our people, uh, some one of the lieutenants apparently in the DMZ attempted to take a picture of a North Korean while they were both in the MDL, and uh, a fist fight broke out or something ensued. I don't know exactly what it was about, but I don't think the battalion commander wanted any photography enthusiasts or any other photo incidents in the MDL. Uh, so I explained that I wasn't into photography, which probably made the battalion commander feel comfortable. I, I know I was concerned about it. I don't think he wanted photography of us taking pictures. Anyway, following the meeting with the battalion commander, I was in process to the battalion and then reported to my company, B Company, the 2nd Battalion, 23rd Infantry. B Company was located in a small camp, a place called Camp Wilbur, less than a mile from the brigade headquarters and the brigade and battalion headquarters. After I arrived at B Company, First Lieutenant Fred Harris, commanding officer, introduced me to the company officers and non-commissioned officers. I was replacing 2nd Lieutenant Thomas Curtin, who was reassigned to the battalion headquarters. Aside from me, 2nd Lieutenant Hugh Davis and 2nd Lieutenant Harlan Frickey were the other platoon leaders. There were three lieutenants, well, four lieutenants, if you include Fred Harris. But Fred was the first lieutenant commander of the company. He carried himself as a captain and was very good. So then the will ask, you say your by your day here is B like battalion? No, B is for B company. The second battalion of the 23rd Infantry consisted of three line companies, Alpha Company, Bravo Company, and Charlie Company, and a headquarters company. So mine was B company with the second battalion of the 23rd Infantry. Yes, the second infantry division, and I guess to understand that, we were one of the line companies <coughs> ABC in the headquarters, but ABC were the line companies in the 2nd Battalion of the 23rd Infantry, and I was assigned to B Company of the 2nd of the 23rd. And this was all a part of the 2nd Infantry Division. There were 10 maneuver battalions in the division organized into three brigades. As I mentioned earlier, my battalion was one of the three battalions assigned to the 3rd Brigade. Then Neil inquired about our APO, which stands for Army Post Office, and I explained that it was APO San Francisco 96224. And that's what the APO was about. So Neil wanted to know, uh, how long were you in the DMZ? And Mr. O'Grady explained I was there from January through June or early July of 1966. I arrived there in January of 1966, and our battalion was relieved by the 1st Battalion of the 23rd Infantry, a straight-leg infantry battalion in late June and early July. Our battalion and its companies went back to camp south of the Imjim River. And that's significant because the entire complexion of the tempo of the area of operations was changing. It was clear that enemy activity was picking up, and my own theory is someone decided it was time to get the mechanized equipment out of the DMZ. The 4th and 7th Cav came back south of the Imjim River at the same time as we. We were replaced by the 1st Battalion of the 23rd Infantry, a non-mechanized or straight leg unit, as such units were called. Then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, why did they pull out the mechanized? Why was that pulled back? Because the casualties were probably estimated at 100%, Mr. O'Grady explained. 90% or more in the first 24 hours. You wouldn't want to lose both the people and the equipment. Keep in mind that we faced an enemy who had overwhelming numerical superiority and a history of unprovoked massive attack on a peaceful neighbor. As I recall, the estimates indicated an army of a million strong opposed us. The North Koreans were aggressive and very hostile. They did not like Americans. If they decided to attack, they would move quickly and with extraordinary velocity and vengeance and violence. So as, at this time, while you were up there, Mr. O'Shea inquired, uh, was it a shooting war or, uh, or was everyone in a state of alert? And Mr. O'Grady said, well, it was both. It was also a shooting war and everybody was on a state of alert. Combat actions in the DMZ have occurred many times since the signing of the Armistice Agreement. Remember, an armistice, not peace agreement, ended the Korean War. What happened after the end of the Korean War could be described as the beginning of the DMZ War. As I understand it, 
From the signing of the Armistice Agreement until today, there have been well over 1,200 combat-related deaths in the DMZ. Now keep in mind that that 1,200 represents the deaths from all allies that would be primarily U.S. and South Koreans. But of that 1,200, we've had well over probably 100 plus casualties of our own deaths in the DMZ. So I explained to Mr. O'Shea, I don't know about you, Neil, but I'd call that a shooting war. Keep in mind, too, that the 3rd Brigade operated in that portion of the DMZ north of Liberty Bridge on the east and Freedom Bridge on the west. These bridges span the Imjim River. Our battalion was assigned the eastern segment of the brigade front, the 1st the 38th, the middle segment, and the 4th of the 7th Cav, the western segment. You may recall that Freedom Bridge was the bridge over which prisoners crossed to Freedom at the end of the Korean War. Um, if I'm also not mistaken, it was the same bridge over which the USS Pueblo prisoners uh, were repatriated and crossed to Freedom. Uh, during my time in the DMZ, Neil, our battalion operated in a three-week cycle. Week one, we operated GPs and OPs. Week two, we conducted patrols. And then week three, we trained. While we were performing our weekly mission, another of the companies in our battalion was performing one of the other missions. For example, while A Company was operating GPs and OPs, B Company would be operating patrols, and C Company would be training. In essence, operations in the DMZ were a 24-7 uh, operation, as they would say today. Training week was a euphemism. During training week, we manned ammo bunkers, staffed various brigade and battalion requirements, clean, maintained equipment, rested and trained as much as time allowed. Our series of GPs and OPs were located on hilltops and were staffed 24 hours a day. The North Koreans had virtually the same thing. I don't know how many positions they had, but our battalion manned four such positions, as I've mentioned, OP Dorton and GPs the Zart Johnson and Seiler. These locations were not far from the MDL, the military demarcation line, and offered good observations of the MDL. The terrain to the sides and rear of these locations was heavily vegetated, dense forest. No civilians were allowed in this area. No one cut down trees or anything else like that. Our job was to observe the enemy and report. Of course, we would also be the tripwire if the enemy decided to attack. As I mentioned earlier, I explained to uh, Mr. O'Shea, Dort, Desart, Johnson, and Silo are not far from the North Korean positions. At night we could observe the glow of their torches and welding equipment, and daylight we observed their troops. And Mr. O'Shea came back to the question of tunneling, and yes, tunneling was there. Theoretically, he couldn't tunnel beneath us. So that would have been a violation of the armistice agreement. But remember, the North Koreans are master liars and would deny they were doing anything wrong anyway. So, um, in all, I pointed out to Mr. O'Shea that these were not nice people, but they were miserable people, as a matter of fact. The North Koreans are consummate liars and will deny any violation of the armistice, they under the armistice that they undertake. Then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, uh, what, which was more challenging, GP duty or patrols, and what was that like? And I pointed out to Mr. O'Shea that both were tense. They were both serious business. You could be killed or wounded very easily. You had to stay sharp and alert at all times. I think both, that would be GPs and OPs, uh, were things that really taxed you in terms of being super alert and, and being situationally aware of what was going on. I probably personally felt more in control in patrols, especially ambushes. In these cases, you picked the spot, you were more in control of what was going on, you waited for the enemy to walk into it, so you might feel more in control. I was always very cautious and nevertheless on patrols, even if I were setting and staging them at places that I wanted them to occur. OP and G op GP operations were also tense. You are located on top of hills. It's cold and the wind is blowing up there, sometimes at 40 or more miles per hour, and it makes the sound of wind blowing wind. Uh, it was very difficult to hear. You can't cover your ears because if you did cover your ears, say with earmuffs or something like that, you couldn't hear something moving out in front of you. And this was especially the case at night where you had to rely on all of your senses. You had to not only see, but you had to hear what was going on too. 
So that can cost you and your men your lives. You, you really needed to be on maximum alert and paying attention to what was going on when you were in the GPs and OPs. Then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, was I up in these? And the answer was, yes, I was. And what was it like? Uh, did you have to check back in every hour? And the answer was, yes, exactly. We called in hourly observations, or more frequently, depending on what was happening, both day and night. At night, it was especially scary. Aside from severe cold heat, winds and rain and snow, you had to deal with noisy propaganda broadcasts, the glow from torches and welding, the presence of wild animals, and the enemy not far away. You had to keep a tight rein on your fears. Also, you couldn't let your imagination, imagination run away with itself. Some men found this duty extraordinarily stressful. At night, uh, Neil, he wanted to know about movement in the DMZ. Well, at night, you had radar. This is side B of the interview between Neil O'Shea and Martin O'Grady. It's a continuation of the point where we left off talking about the barrier that was built in the DMZ in 1967 or 68, the building of a fence. And we will continue the conversation at that point. Uh, Mr. O'Shea had a question about whether or not Mr. O'Grady thought the building of this barrier, this fence, was a good idea. Mr. O'Grady essentially said yes, he thought it was a good idea. Then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know uh, where was the fence in relation to the MDL. Mr. O'Grady explained, or I explained, that I didn't know. Remember, I wasn't there when the fence was erected. Mr. O'Shea then said uh, it would have to be behind it, though, wouldn't it? And Mr. O'Grady said, yes, the barrier would have to have been behind the MDL, would have to have been south of it. Otherwise, it would have been a violation. Um, if, uh, and then Mr. O'Shea, again, wanted to know about uh, how, how far from the MDL would have been. And the answer, because I wasn't there, I don't know, but my answer would have been, I suppose, as close as you could probably get to the MDL without causing a violation. And what would be the reason for then all sorts of other considerations as well. But what would the reason for that be? Uh, we weren't going to uh, concede any territory to them. That's kind of what it amounted to. So then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know uh, that this was a, a very pal challenging place for the six months that I was up there. And the answer was yes. And uh, it was a very challenging for six months. And then we returned. Not only I, but the entire battalion, the 2nd of the 23rd Infantry Mechanized, was ordered from the DMZ to position south of the Imjem River. And as I explained earlier, we were replaced by the 1st Battalion of the 23rd Infantry. So uh, our battalion and the 4th of the 7th Cav were ordered to location south of the Imjem River. Uh, straight Leg Infantry battalions relieved us. Remember, as I said earlier, it was clear that enemy activity was increasing. I suspect that someone decided that it was better to have the tracked vehicles units move south of the Imjem River if the North Koreans attack. The point here, though, that I stressed to Mr. O'Shea was that the GPs and OPs were manned and observing what was going on 24 hours a day. Patrols are also conducted day and night in the DMZ. On the south side of the Imjem River, this would be the south of the side of the river, not the DMZ side, but the south side of the river, less active area. Units and brigades located there conducted what were called SCOSI patrols, and these were surveillance and counter espionage operations south of the Imjem River. And these patrols were intended to stop any enemy infiltration that came through the DMZ. So if we miss them in the DMZ, and they were successful in crossing the river, they would then encounter SCOSI patrols and operations south of the river. Again, they, these were entitled surveillance and counter-espionage operations south of the Imjim. So in all, as I explained to Mr. O'Shea, this was very serious business. The North Korean infiltrations were probably intelligence agents. Uh, it was reported they had large sums of money with them to support their operations in South Korea. When the officers in our battalion were not on GP or OP duty or leading patrols, we performed other duties at the brigade and battalion level. And one of the duties was to serve as the TAC officer at the battalion brigade TAC. Mr. O'Shea wanted to know what TAC meant, and that's a tactical operations center. You could think of it uh, as uh, a radio and communications equipment area. We would monitor all tactical communications, request and receive reports, and advise operating elements our commander and staff and higher headquarters what was happening. 
at the brigade level, I listened to everything going on across three battalions, and I reported back to division. Then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know if I ever had to call up uh, back or go up the channel on what you thought was a happening or a major event. And the answer was yes. We had to because we had to make periodic reports to higher headquarters. For example, we reported the content of all propaganda broadcasts and sightings and other contacts that was made. And then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, uh, even when you were back up there, when you were in the battalion the third week, was that, uh, during the training week, was that back in your battalion area, back in your company area or battalion? And the answer was that when you were assigned to talk duties, uh, our battalion and brigade headquarters, the locations of both talks were in the same general area at Camp Young. So when you had this duty, when you had the tactical operations center duty, uh, you would leave your company area temporarily and stay at Camp uh, Young temporarily. Uh, so <clears throat> Camp Young was the location of both the brigade and battalion headquarters. They explained to Mr. O'Shea, if I recall correctly, someone uh, somewhat hard to do without a map. Camp Young was about two kilometers from the southern edge of the uh, south tape of the DMZ. And I could be wrong in that. It could have been a little more, but it was very close to the DMZ in any event. So the south zone boundary, yes, the southern boundary, of the DMZ was called the South Tape. And from the South Tape was probably another maybe 2,000 meters back to the battalion or brigade headquarters. But we were co-located, at both were co-located, in our case, the battalion and the brigade headquarters at Camp Young. They were in different structures, buildings, but they were both at Camp Young. All our units were not located too great a distance from the DMZ. You had to have the ability to rapidly deploy what was called a quick reaction force, a QRF, to deal with incidents. And the quick reaction force would reinforce engaged elements. So you needed to be pretty near the DMZ to be able to do that. So uh, Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, uh, did you ever have to put them on alert? And the answer was yes. The quick reaction force was always on alert. Uh, were they always waiting? And the answer was yes, their vehicles were loaded and readied. They were prepared to respond rapidly. So was there ever a time that, uh, did, did I lose any of my men? Did any of your men ever fire their weapons? The answer was no, I didn't lose any of my men. The only thing that I recall personally was being probed one evening while on a GP. The radar showed moving target indicators to our front. I wasn't sure if that were people or animals. I wanted to recon by fire, essentially suit at the suspected target to draw fire. And that was going on. I called the, the talk because I was again out now in the role I'm playing now. I'm out commanding one of these positions. And we suspect that there's movement in front of us. We suspect it's the enemy. So I call back to the talk, the Tactical Operations Center at Battalion, and report this. And the talk advised that I was, and I advised the talk I was preparing to recon by fire, essentially shooting at this target to see if it would fire back. The target indicators had moved to a point closer than 100 meters to our position, and that's dangerous because our radar is now ineffective. The radar would not register less than 100 meters. It was very dark. It was evening time, and we were looking down the side of a mountain. We couldn't see anything. You couldn't determine if you were sensing animals or people. Some animals in the DMZ moved in formations, much like people would. So Neil wanted to know, did you go through with the recon by fire? And the answer was, no, I did not, because I was advised not to. We were told to be very cautious. Well, that's what happened. We didn't recon by fire, uh, nor did we take any fire. In the morning, we carefully investigated the suspect at area and found nothing. But even today, I can tell you, Neil, that they were there. We were just lucky. They probably sensed what, that we were prepared for them, and they, wouldn't, they couldn't surprise us. They withdrew. At one point, I did fire a flare, and that too may have scared them off. But I can tell you, as sure as there's a Christ in heaven today, they were there. And I sensed they, they knew that we would have uh, banged them if they had come across, so uh, they went back. So Mr. O'Shea then wanted to know about the importance of defending the Soul Case on Corridor. Uh, it was a very important area of operations, I explained. It was perched along the Soul Case Song Quarter, this area that we had on the DMZ. And that's the important thing. This area would have been the likely invasion route of North Korean armor as it moved towards Seoul. It was a very favorable invasion route. The topography of the land promoted it. There's a natural, if you will, pass from Kaesong in the north to Seoul. 
So Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, is the state of readiness, uh, this, this sort of beehive of alertness intelligence that's not replicated all across the DMZ? And the answer is, I really don't know, because I had really only been in our own area, and that would have been the you know, three battalions of our own brigade. And I really was only familiar with my own battalion in depth, because that's where I actually had tactical field experience, although I was a TAC officer and saw what the other battalions did. But actually being on patrols and GPs and OPs was in my own battalion area. So I don't know, but I'm sure that it was in terms of alertness. The South Koreans are certainly very alert and very vigilant. And if you'll recall, if you look at our newspapers periodically, even until today, you have reported attempts by North Korean incursions in the South Korea and the exchange of fire, including the exchange of artillery fire. So these North Koreans are dangerous folk, despite what uh, anyone else might think of them. Um, trading shots. Trading shots could happen at any time, I explained to Mr. O'Shea. And that goes along with this, uh, this entire 151-mile zone. Remember, in my time, we only had a small piece of it. In fact, I'm, I think today, if I recall from newspaper accounts, U.S. units are no longer deployed in the DMZ. So Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, were you nervous up there? And I pointed out to him, oh, there was always a question of nerves, but you learn to deal with it. You learn to control it and to effectively perform your mission. Rather than nervous, you become highly alert. You can become sensitive to and aware of everything that happens around you. You become confident what you can do, but not cocky. So yes, are you nervous? Uh, nerves may not be uh, a good description. It's probably more a case of being extraordinarily vigilant and being aware of everything around you, because that's basically how you survive. And again, as I said earlier in this report, one mistake out there, and it's your last mistake. Tense or something. Well, I said I was, I was happy not having to concern myself when we returned back to uh, south of the position south of the river. And my men, uh, we didn't have to spend 24 hours a day worrying about what was going on in the DMZ. The DMZ was not a joke. Um, you know, it wasn't something to laugh at. Even though we had things to laugh about, and we always found humor in what we did. It was serious business. Uh, I was back up there again in November of 1966 in another operation, and there was an incident in early November. And so o Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, this is several months later, and the answer is yes, in November. I left the zone late June or early July and went down to division headquarters after that. And uh, something happened up there in, in November, and I went back. So between July and November, did you get a little R&R &R and whatever? And I said, no. I was assigned to division headquarters when our company relocated. One of the assistant information officers at the division was rotating home. A friend of mine from Port Benning, a fellow named Dick Finn, Second Lieutenant Richard Finn, who was a Harvard graduate, recommended me as a replacement. The division information officer called and asked if I would be interested in becoming an assistant information officer. And I said, yes, absolutely. So I visited Camp Howe's location of the division headquarters interviewed. I got the job. I was one of the few people, young lieutenants at least, at the division headquarters who had experience in the DMZ. So that was probably a plus, a valuable asset to the division in a way. And then in early November, an incident took place where two patrols were hit. The patrols came from the battalion that replaced our battalion. They were hit in the same area in which I had operated. Yes, yeah, so it was two patrols. He, uh, Mr. O'Shea wanted to confirm it was two patrols, and I said, yeah, it was two patrols, if I recall correctly. And he wanted to know how many were killed. Uh, as I recall, five or six GIs and one Katusa were killed. One man survived by playing dead when the North Koreans searched their bodies. And then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know about Katusas, and the answer is yes, Katusa. It's an acronym, K-A-T-U-S-A. -S it stands for Korean Augmentation to the U.S. Army. Korean troops were assigned to U.S. units and worked side by side with their U.S. counterparts. The idea was for them to acclimate to us and we to them. The problem was they couldn't speak our language or spoke it on a very limited basis, so communications at times was very difficult. Um, so Mr. O'Shea confirmed that this tragic incident took place in November, and I said yes in November. The troops were from the 1st to the 23rd, 1st Battalion of the 23rd Infantry. That was the unit that replaced us. I was at division headquarters at the time as an information officer and was responsible for command information. I drove up to the area of the incident uh, shortly after it occurred to collect any information that would be of value to our command information program. 
I was also a member of the detail from the 3rd Brigade who accompanied the deceased to Tachikawa Air Force Base in Japan for an honor guard memorial ceremony and return home. Then uh, Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, did I go to the Japan for that ceremony? And the answer was yes, I went with the 3rd Brigade Honor Guard, and I believe I still have some pictures of the memorial ceremony somewhere. Clearly, enemy activity in the DMZ was heating up. From my view, the war was on again on a small unit level. The engagements and contacts were taking place with more and more frequency. Our division received a new assistant division commander from Nuber at this time, Brigadier General George M. Signius II, and he needed an aide, someone preferably familiar with the zone. I became his interim aide until he chose a permanent aide. Brigadier General Signius aide was aide, Signius aide was a tremendous experience. Um, being his aide was a tremendous experience. He was a skillful officer and a gentleman. Uh, <clears throat> Signius, as I recall, later in life became a salt negotiator in later years. He, he has since died. Uh, when I was assigned as his interim aide, he asked me, have you ever been an aide before? And I said, no, sir. And he said, that's good because I've never had one before. We'll both learn together. Uh, General Signius was a southern gentleman from South Carolina, as I recall, and a very decent fellow. He was a Citadel graduate and a World War II combat veteran. I believe he served in the 11th Armored Cav at one time in his career. I got to meet some of his 11th Cav colleagues. Uh, they were all in Seoul one day, and he introduced me to them. The last patrol that I made in the DMZ in late November was with General Signius. He wanted to go out on a patrol, and by God, he did. This was after that major incident that I previously described in November. So my last combat operation in the DMZ uh, on a patrol was with General Signius, who actually went out on this patrol. So uh, Neil O'Shea, Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, was I his information aide? And the answer is no. It's not called information aide. It's called aide de camp, actually. So I was his aide de camp. I want to make it clear here, too, that uh, this assignment with General Signius was a position of honor. I wasn't ordered to it. I, I hope I'm not creating the wrong impression here. but. Uh, this was a position of honor. They needed someone to serve as his aide who was uh, knowledgeable about what was going on in the DMZ. And as a junior officer, that was me. And it was uh, there were many other lieutenants at the division headquarters who would like to have had this position. So I was very fortunate in being chosen for it. And I, uh, I, it was an honor to be chosen for it. So I want to make that very clear. I don't want it to sound like I was being forced into this. Uh, yet I wasn't being forced into it at all. So. It was an honor. I enjoyed the job very much. And Mr. O'Shea wanted to know how long I was with the general, and the answer was three or four weeks, as I recall. I really don't remember clearly. Uh, the reason for that being is that he needed a permanent aide, and I was going home at the end of February, beginning of March. So, and that, in fact, is what happened. I left uh, Korea at the end of February, as I recall, and returned to the United States. And I was being reassigned to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And an interesting thing about that was is that an officer with whom I had served in Korea was assigned to 5th Army Headquarters, which was then located at 51st and Cornell in the south side of Chicago. And he wrote me a letter before I left Korea and said, hey, when you're at home, on leave, please visit me. So while I was on leave after leaving Korea myself, I stopped and visited this gentleman at 5th Army Headquarters. And then one of the senior staff officers there learned that I was a, uh, a graduate of Loyola, of Loyola University, Chicago Area University, and he said his staff really would like to have had a, a local university graduate on their staff. And I said, well, I'm available, take me. But it didn't happen that way, as I explained to Neil O'Shea. I was being assigned to a specific assignment at Le Fort Leonard Wood for which I was needed, and the Fifth Army didn't want to interfere, interfere with that assignment. So I reported to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and, uh, and I served there for about six months, and I completed my term of service at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and was released from active duty as, in September of 1967. I planned to return to law school, but remember I owed the Army five years total active service. And that could be five years in active duty, or a combination of active reserves for a minimum of two years and active duty. So after my release from active duty, I had to find a reserve unit in Chicago, and I joined the 327th Military Police Battalion at O'Hare Field. And I stayed with the 327th until 1970. And then, and then at that point, it was interesting. I almost considered leaving the Army. 
I figured I had completed my contractual service obligation. But then I decided to stay. I was in the insurance business at that time, and I worked with two colleagues who were reserve majors, one a Marine and one an Army major. They suggested I think about staying in the reserves. One of them said, I'm with the unit, a very specialized unit that does civil affairs work. It's a group of diversified professionals, policemen, firemen, journalists, medical people, attorneys, engineers, economists, and, and many others. So uh, it, it, the mission is to administer a region of a country until the local government reestablishes itself, kind of what happened in Germany at the end of World War II. And I said, wow, that seems very interesting. So uh, it's very much like what was being done in Iraq until the Iraqis elected their own government, where our units were actually administering the government. So uh, my colleague said, why don't you extend for at least a year, give it a try. I then joined the 308th Civil Affairs Group and enjoyed the experience. I stayed with the 308th from 1970 until 1976. I had a number of assignments with that unit. I was the public safety officer, the civil information officer, the intelligence officer, the S2 for the group, and assistant operations officer, S3. I later commanded the 910th Military Intelligence Company, and was a, which was a subordinate unit of the 308 Civil Affairs Group. Mr. O'Shea inquired if these were full-time jobs, and the answer was no, they were not full-time jobs. I was still in the insurance business, but they were active reserve jobs meaning that I spent a great deal of time uh, both during the weeks and during the summer performing my reserve duties. So these were active reserve assignments. Mr. O'Shea then asked me about had I ever considered making a career in the Army, and the answer was yes. I was offered a regular Army commission when I graduated from college, but I thought about becoming a lawyer and attending law school. So I, I decided at that time that I didn't think a career in the Army is what I was going to do, at least the active Army. I really didn't know a great deal about the Army Reserve, so I didn't even consider that. So Mr. O'Shea then asked about my father. He said, was your dad a career Army? And the answer was no, my dad was not a career Army person. My dad was a Chicago policeman, a very proud and uh, good Chicago policeman. He served as an officer during World War II, and upon leaving active duty in 1947, returned to the Chicago Police Department. Uh, and my dad, in fact, was a military police officer and then when the war ended, he returned, as I said, to his civilian career as a police officer in Chicago, but he stayed in the reserves. He had, no, he had to leave the reserves in 1954 when my youngest brother came down with polio. So my dad had to, to leave his reserve assignment, which I think he uh, probably missed a great deal. I know that he loved the, the service, but my brother required a lot of attention. But the military in our home, Neil, as I explained to Mr. O'Shea, was highly respected and the obligation to serve our country was real. It was a tacit expectation. It was something that was uh, not sold or talked up. It was simply expected. It was a given that you would serve. No big deal was made of it. Neil then wanted to know what part of Chicago that I was raised in. The answer was the northwest side. My dad was, as we say in Chicago, a south sider. My mother was a west sider. Uh, on the, my dad was from a parish, in a Catholic parish on the south side, uh, St. Agnes Parish and then St. Rita Parish. And my mother's family were, were Westsiders, interestingly enough. And my mother lived on Jackson Boulevard, and they were from St. Mel Parish. So Mr. O'Shea said, your mother was a Westsider? And the answer was, yeah, my family, my immediate family, my parents, my brothers and sisters and I, we lived in St. Francis Borgia Parish on the northwest side until I was in college. And then we moved to Edgebrook to St. Mary of the Woods Parish, also on the northwest side. About choosing the career in the Army, Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, did I miss ever getting back into law again? Or, or, and the answer was, well, when I came home in September, I slept for what seemed like a week. I had become financially independent in the Army and didn't look forward to depending on my parents for support in law school. I'd also been accepted into grad school upon undergraduate graduation and decided to attend grad school and get a master's degree. I wanted a full-time job while I attended graduate school. So I decided to attend graduate school instead of and earned a master's degree. And then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know what field. Was it in, in history? And I said, no, it was in educational psychology. I have a master's in, in gui educational guidance and counseling. So Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, and uh, did you stay in insurance then? And the answer was yes. What happened is I went to graduate school. I did have a full-time job in the insurance industry. By the time I received my master's degree, I had advanced in my civilian job and began considering insurance as a potential career. 
was also married by this time and was awaiting the birth of our first child. So uh, shortly after I left active duty, I met a fraternity brother from undergraduate school. He mentioned that his company would be very interested in me. The job was claim representative, and I became a field claim representative. I investigated and negotiated the settlement of insurance claims. And it's like anything else. You get good at what you're doing, it becomes your career. I stayed in the insurance business for a total of 38 years. And then Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, am I retired? And the answer is yes. I am now completely retired, and I have been so probably for a couple years, although I still teach professional education classes for the Insurance School of Chicago. And uh, in our field, it's called Charter Property Casualty CPCU classes, and it's probably the premier education program for people in the insurance industry. So Mr. O'Shea said you met a lot of magnificent people that you encountered in the service. Did you ever maintain or were you able to maintain friendships with any of them? And the answer was for the first several years I did. But as the years progressed, you, know, you lose contact. Of course, I've maintained close contact with several of my reserve colleagues. I think this happened because we were all from the same geographical area and we saw each other over an extended period. Even these relationships are passing, however, as the years take their toll. In fact, uh, it, it's funny, as I'm doing this, it's uh, just after Christmas and uh, in the early part of 2007, and I'm thinking of several of the folks that I've communicated with in the last few weeks are folks that I was in the Army with, uh, especially the Reserves. I was on active duty from uh, 1965 to 1967, and in the Reserves from 1967 to 1986. Uh, from 1986 until 2002, I was in the inactive Reserve, um, and, and I retired in 2002. Mr. O'Shea inquired about what reserve service was like, and he was saying, so from 1967 to 1986, was that like a weekend a month? And the answer was basically, but a little more than that. Um, and he wanted to know, is there something like summer camp? And the answer is yes, and sometimes it's more than a weekend a month as well. But yes, that's more or less what it was. You frequently attended administrative drills in addition to weekend drills and spent many uncompensated hours of your own time. So for someone listening to this, I can't stress how important it is to really understand this, the Reserve and Guard programs. They're magnificent programs for folks, and you do spend a lot of time. Um, you're going to spend the equivalent of a half day per week at meetings, and in most units they combine that into a weekend assembly. So you're, you're gone for a Saturday and a Sunday, once a month at least, and then you go away typically for a couple of weeks. It could be throughout the year, they call it summer camp, but it could be at any time during the year where you go for two weeks of active duty for training. And then if you're an officer or you get higher in the NCO ranks, you begin putting in a lot of extra time to make sure that the unit is ready to uh, perform its mission. And, and anyway, it's, it's a great experience, and it does require time, and it is a little more than a weekend a month in summer camps, and people should know that, but it's, it's time well spent. Mr. O'Shea inquired about the, um, the ways that the military affected my life, as, and, it, and he said one of the things it did was direct you toward a career, right, because I was a claims officer. Well, the answer had is that it did have an influence on in my career choices. Civilian employers in the late 1960s, at the time that I got out, found military officers attractive employment candidates. But the major influence on your life from the military lies in the area of character and honor. Nothing in my civilian career could compare to the military in terms of character and honor. Additionally, civilian managers at every level pale in comparison to the military leaders at comparable levels. When you encounter a top-flight civilian manager, you no doubt will often find a military background. Mr. O'Shea wanted to know then about uh, uh, my connections with the military. Uh, was it because of my connections with the military that I got the job? And the answer is um, possibly, but I think it had more to do in the insurance part, too, with the fact that I had been in law school. Uh, insurance claims, the area that I specialized in when I entered the insurance business, it's very much involved with making decisions based upon contractual obligations and applicable laws. I think the fact that I've been in law school probably was attractive to my employer as well. What's my opinion of military justice? I find it extraordinarily fair. As a matter of fact, by the time you may be charged with something in the military, the odds are well beyond 9 out of 10 that you actually did what it is that you did. So 
I always found military justice, uh, from what I observed, to be extraordinarily fair. I was also the uh, assistant uh, defense counsel for the 2nd Infantry Division, a number of court martials, and I thought in those cases that the military justice system was extraordinarily fair to, to, uh, to the people who were accused of uh, various infractions. So I have a high regard for the military justice system. I find it extraordinarily fair. Um, so Mr. O'Shea wanted to know, was I tempted to become a lawyer, and if I had become a lawyer, would I have been in the judge advocate? And the answer was, yeah, I had originally intended to becoming a lawyer, and had I finished law school, I certainly would have sought appointment to the judge advocate branch of the uh, United States Army. That's where I would want to have served. And Mr. O'Shea asked about the impact of service on life, and I said, uh, as I said earlier to Mr. O'Shea, the military impact on my life was well beyond occupational. In fact, uh, to be very honest, some of the finest organizations in the country couldn't compare or hold a candle to the military. The, the leadership that one encounters in, the, in many of the nation's top insurance companies, or for that matter, any of the other companies that I've been involved with, it absolutely lacks, pales in comparison to the military. The military is heads and shoulders above virtually every other organization when you imagine that you can imagine in terms of leadership and mission accomplishment. Military people are well trained. They know what they are doing. They are dedicated. They are committed to the mission. They're inspired, motivated. They've got effective leadership, leadership that truly and actually cares for its people and looks out for, the mili for, for them. Uh, military leaders have character, integrity, and morals and in in loyalty. When you contrast to that to what you see in the civilian world, uh, the world of business, education, and government, academia for that matter as well, it's much different than uh, civilian life. But, uh, you know, it's very interesting too. My brother and I have these conversations frequently about this very question about the impact of the military and, and one's life. And we look at Katrina. And who are the heroes of Katrina? Uh, with people like Lieutenant General Russell Honore who was one of the go-to guys, uh, the Coast Guard Admiral, whose name I've forgotten. They were models of outstanding leadership and technical competence. It's uh, the Air Force General Michael Hayden at the CIA. The military appears to be the one consistent source of competent and honest leaders that the nation can rely upon to get things done efficiently and effectively, especially in time of emergency. Um, then Neil, Mr. O'Shea pointed out that they, they serve the greater good, and I said, that's, that's, that's the impact it had on me, uh, Neil. As a matter of fact, I would say that in some of the organizations that I have served with in my civilian career, a military background was probably a disadvantage. Some of the people in these organizations didn't appreciate the military and people with military backgrounds. This wasn't the case when I began my civilian career. When I started, many of the civilian leaders were World War II and Korean vets and respected the military background. By the end of my career, many non-vets, 60s generation types or wannabes, occupied leadership positions and had contempt for the military and military backgrounds. Incredibly, they often described the wrong way of doing things as the military way. But I, Mr. O'Shea then said, well, they held your military background against you. And I said, no, not really, not only against me, Neil, but others as well, the military in general. Many of these people had no experience with the military and ascribed to it traits that were inaccurate and false. Again, many of these people are 60s generation wannabes. I think it's important too, Neil, to recognize that this issue is, is coming back again contemporarily in politics where people are saying, hey, we're at a point in our history where several of the people representing us <clears throat> in government, for example, don't have military backgrounds. They never serve. They have no idea what the military is like. Something to think about. Their uh, appreciation of the military is lacking, frankly. So you wanted to know <clears throat> about the story of the DMZ, and I said, Neil, the story had to be told and to be understood. One of my pet peeves is that the recognition for what went on in the DMZ in Korea was never given. And it's still not today. But the Korean Defense Service Medal a recently authorized and issued medal for service in Korea from 1954 on hardly recognizes the unique service that those who actually served in the DMZ deserve. Eventually in 1968, if I recall correctly, hostile fire pay was authorized for service in the DMZ, but it wasn't retroactive. That's
authorization of different awards and decorations that should have been made, in my opinion, for actual DMZ service was were never given. So it's a story of a lot of people who took immense risk, as much as they would have in Vietnam, and were never recognized for. Uh, perhaps, and this gets back to what was going on as they uh, heated up the, the the issue in Korea. And again, this happened throughout my time. I would say that began happening probably sometime in 1965, although they were skirmishing ever since the end of the Korean War. But certainly by 1965, the activity is beginning to build, and it. It really builds by November of 66, but throughout that period that I was there, it was building. You could feel it and sense it. The activity was growing. Um, and I think maybe what the communist strategy was at that point, uh, as I explained to Mr. O'Shea, was that by heating up Korea, they'd take the pressure off Vietnam. In other words, by heating up Korea, we would have to focus more on Korea and perhaps not be able to send as many folk to Vietnam and equipment, etc., as we were. I explained to Mr. O'Shea that it was not just the period that I was there. It was the period from the ending of the Korean War until today. All the people that were there from the end of the war, people actually serving in the DMZ that, in my view, were overlooked. The DMZ remains today a very dangerous place. You could pop your head up there in one of those positions and be gone in a second. And that's how it works. But it's a story that needs to be told, and the people who served in the DMZ should have been recognized far more than they have been. Our uh, company first sergeant told me that, and this is 1966, that it was no different today than 1966, the day I was standing there talking to him, than it was when he left there in 1953. He said, you're, and I said to him, you're kidding me, and he said, no, it's the same thing. We did the very same thing. We occupied these positions, these defensive positions, and we conducted patrols. And that's what we did. And he added, it's no different. Mr. O'Shea then wanted to know about the O'Grady family history. And he said, uh, do you, is the military tradition in the family? And the answer is, yes, it is. Uh, my father's, my uncle's, uh, on both my mother's side and my father's side of the family served. Uh, they served in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps. So we've had uh, Air Force, we've had people throughout our, our family since the time they've been in the United States that have served their country. My son is a major in the United States Air Force. He graduated from the Air Force Academy, and we're extraordinarily proud of him. We're also proud of all of our children and their accomplishments. Uh, we raised our children here in Niles, Illinois. My wife taught at St. John Bray Buff School. Now all of our children attended St. John Bray Buff. The boys went on to Notre Dame High School and the girls to Merillac High School. And um, uh, it's, it's, it was really a pleasure to live in, in Niles, raise my family in Niles. And my children all have a respect for our country and the military. Uh, my boys have done well. One is a career military officer, as I said. One is a CPA and the other is a pharmaceutical sales rep. Um, I wanted my boys, the twins to uh, go into ROTC, but one of them has an eye problem and uh, he couldn't uh, serve. But the university he attended allowed him to take ROTC classes as an elective. So uh, he and his twin brother did take uh, leadership courses as electives and really enjoyed it. My daughters have also done very well. They've been educated well and have succeeded. One is a CPA, one is a scientist, and who now works as a real estate broker, and our youngest, like her mother, is a teacher. Uh, I think the story of the military, Neil, as I explained to Mr. O'Shea, is the story of the Irish in America. The Irish came to America and wanted to be American citizens. They wanted to be Americans. They served their new country with pride, loyalty, and devotion, as have their descendants. Uh, my family come from the County Mayo and County Roscommon in Ireland. Uh, my father's family were Mayo people, and my mother's family were Roscommon and Clare people. Uh, I was in Europe in business in 1987. I had the opportunity to meet several of my families, my father's family, and it was a joy to see them. I hope one day to return and to uh, see them again and their children. Uh, I was not, I'm not directly related as, uh, as I understand to uh, the former superintendent, uh, James O'Grady, but he was a neighbor. And he lived near us, and I know James O'Grady. My father and he were served together, and uh, we consider James O'Grady to be a very fine gentleman. Um, 
And I, again, as I said about the Irish in America to Mr. O'Shea, I think it's the story of, um, of their service to their country. They've committed themselves to it. And if you look at these long legacies and families of military service and fire and police departments and other government agencies, it's kind of what they do, I suppose. I try not to push my grandchildren about the military, but I do talk positively about it. They have to have a model for it. It was interesting that you asked, uh, Mr. O'Shea asked me about schooling, since my mother probably talked to me about going to West Point at some point, but I never really thought about it. If I had known then what I know today, I probably would have applied to attend West Point. Um, but I had a wonderful civilian education, and I don't want to push that on the side. I really enjoyed my military education as well. I trained in the infantry, uh, civil affairs, military intelligence, and military police. I also graduated from the Army Command and General Staff College and the Air Force War College. So the military has been a great experience for me. Mr. O'Shea inquired about my awards and decorations, and they include the National Defense Service Medal, the Korean Defense Service Medal, the Army Reserve Components Achievement Medal with Bronze Oak Leaf Cluster, the Army Reserve Medal, the Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, the Army Commendation Medal with two Bronze Oak Leaf Clusters, the Meritorious Service Medal. I'm also a parachutist. And Mr. O'Shea wanted to know that I jumped from a plane. The answer is yes, I did jump from a plane. He also wanted to know that I meet my wife while I was in uniform. The answer was no. Uh, my wife isn't Irish either. She's an Austri She's Austrian and German. Her father was a World War II vet, another member of the greatest generation. And uh, that's interesting because our fathers were both were World War II military vets. I met my wife in graduate school, and the interesting part was that the Army began recalling people shortly after we met. I left active duty in September of 1967. They began recalling people in March of 1968. The sergeant major of our battalion at O'Hare Field thought we would be recalled, especially the junior officers. I asked my wife to marry me in August of 1968, but I said that I hoped that we could make our plans because I may be, recall, be recalled to active duty. Fortunately, I didn't get recalled, and we were married in 1969, but the possibility of recall is part of the reserve program, and you have to make peace with it. That's something that angers me about the malicious criticism that some have given President Bush. He was an Air Force Reserve fighter pilot. Dan Quayle served in the Indiana Guard, and all these people who serve in Reserve and Guard units risk the call to active duty. This is especially true in Iraq. If I recall correctly, somewhere about a third of the force in Iraq is Reserve and Guard. The Guard and the Reserves have come into their own in, in terms of the military. They're absolutely dependent upon they're an inherent part of the total force. They're this component that's absolutely required and relied upon today. Neil, you asked me, or Mr. O'Shea asked me at the end to add any additional words that I'd like to add that have not been included in the interview, and there are just a few, and it's basically people. As I've reflected on this interview, I've thought of some people whose names should have been mentioned in this and, and who are not. So for posterity, I'd like to mention Colonel Frederick W. Osa. He was Chief of Staff of the 2nd Infantry Division when I served in Korea. And I often think of him because he worked tirelessly. He was an outstanding uh, Chief of Staff, and he set an example from work. When all the rest of us were tired, he seemed to be endlessly energetic. I, the man must have worked 15, 16 hours a day. And as my career unfolded at different times, I would always think about him and the example he set. So. Colonel Osef, wherever you are, God bless you. You certainly set an example for me. Other people who I'd like to re recall in terms of this uh, interview are people from the 308 Civil Affairs Group especially. In this case, I'd like to cite Colonel James Liston, Colonel William Peterson, and Colonel uh, Kenneth Merrick. These were the commanders of the 308 CA Group at the time that I served with it, and each of them were outstanding. I especially remember Colonel Merrick commanding the unit during a period of time in our society when the military was not very popular, just at the end of uh, Vietnam. And it was a time when it was uh, very trying nationally, and I think even in the military, especially the reserve program. And I thought he conducted himself excellently. He was a World War II veteran, a combat veteran of the 25th Infantry Division, and he set an example for all of us to follow. He was an outstanding leader and a good man. Another name that comes to my mind that I should mention is Lieutenant Colonel George N. Becker. Lieutenant Colonel George Becker and I 
Uh, we, our careers crossed a few different times at the 327th Military Police Battalion and then at the 308 Civil Affairs Group. Lieutenant Colonel Becker is now retired, but he was probably one of the finest company-grade officers that I have ever met. He was tactically and technically proficient, and he is. I shouldn't say was. The man is still alive, but he's an outstanding officer. Went on to serve in various staff assignments in the 308 Civil Affairs Group and ultimately retired as the unit executive officer. So God bless George Becker. He's an outstanding leader. That's about it. My last comment here is for anyone listening to this, the Guard and Reserve are important parts of the military, and I encourage anyone listening to this to consider serving in them. Your time will be well spent. Your country needs you, and uh, you'll find service in these units to be extraordinarily personally rewarding, not so much in terms of finances, but in terms of things that really account character, integrity, loyalty. You can't beat it. So thank you for listening. Again, uh, please think of these folks that are serving around the world, especially in places where they're not getting much attention. And today that happens to be Afghanistan and whoever we still have in Korea. It's up there today carrying the ball and no one knows about it. So uh, God bless them and thank you for listening to this.